You can create who you are over and over again. Indeed, you do every day. As things now stand, you do not always come up with the same answer. Given an identical outer experience, one day you might choose to be patient, loving, and kind. On day two, you may choose to be angry, ugly, and sad. The master is one who always comes up with the same answer, and that answer is always the highest choice. In this, the master is immediately predictable. Conversely, the student is completely unpredictable. Of course, this begs the question, what choice is the highest? If this question engages you, you are already on your way to mastery. Most people continue to ask another question altogether. Not what is the highest choice, but what is the most profitable? Or how can I lose the least? When life is lived from a standpoint of damage control or optimum advantage, the true benefit of life is forfeited. The opportunity is lost. The chance is missed. For a life lived thusly is a life lived from fear, and that life speaks a lie about you. For you are not fear. You are love. Love that needs no protection, love that cannot be lost, yet you will never know this if you ask the latter question and not the first. For only a person who thinks there is something to gain or to lose asks those questions, and only a person who sees life in a different way, who sees life as a higher being, who understands that winning or losing is not the test, but only loving or failing to love. Only that person asks the first question. Let all those who have ears to hear listen, for I tell you this, there is only one question. What would love do now? No other question is relevant. No other question is meaningful. No other question has any importance to your soul. Yet the principle of love-sponsored action has been widely misunderstood. For centuries you have been taught that love-sponsored action arises out of the choice to be do and have whatever produces the highest good for another. Yet I tell you this, the highest choice is that which produces the highest good for you. As with all profound spiritual truth, this statement opens itself to immediate misinterpretation. The mystery clears a bit the moment one decides what is the highest good one could do for oneself. And when the absolute highest choice is made, the mystery dissolves, the circle completes itself, and the highest good for you becomes the highest good for another. It may take lifetimes to understand this, and even more lifetimes to implement. For this truth revolves around an even greater one. What you do for yourself, you do for another. What you do for another, you do for yourself. This is because you and the other are one. And this is because there is only you. All the masters who have walked your planet have taught this. I say unto you, inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Yet this has remained for most people merely a grand esoteric truth with little practical application. In fact, it is the most practically applicable esoteric truth of all time. It is important in relationships to remember this truth, for without it, relationships will be very difficult. So, to get back to the practical applications of this wisdom, under the old understandings, many people did what they thought would be best for the other person in their relationship. Sadly, all this produced in most cases was continued abuse, continued mistreatment, continued dysfunction in the relationship. Ultimately, the person trying to do what is right by the other, to be quick to forgive, to show compassion, to continually look past certain problems and behaviors, becomes resentful, angry, and mistrusting, even of God, for how can a just God demand such unending suffering, joylessness, and sacrifice, even in the name of love? The answer is, God does not. God asks only that you include yourself among those you love. God goes further. God recommends that you put yourself first. I tell you this, putting yourself first in the highest sense never leads to an ungodly act. 
If, therefore, you have caught yourself in an ungodly act as a result of doing what is best for you, the confusion is not in having put yourself first, but rather in misunderstanding what is best for you. Of course, determining what is best for you will require you to also determine what it is you are trying to do. This is an important step that many people ignore. What are you up to? What is your purpose in life? Without answers to these questions, the matters of what is best in any given circumstances will remain a mystery. You exist in this life, in the world of the relative, where one thing can exist only in so far as it relates to another. This is at one and the same time both the function and the purpose of relationship. To provide a field of experience within which you find yourself, define yourself, and if you choose, constantly recreate who you are. What will get you from here to there most quickly is total honesty. Be willing to assert, acknowledge, and declare exactly how you feel about a thing. Say your truth, kindly, but fully and completely. Live your truth, gently, but totally and consistently. Change your truth, easily and quickly when your experience brings you new clarity? The answer is, you have no obligation, neither in relationship or in all of life, no obligation, nor any restriction or limitation, nor any guidelines or rules, nor are you bound by any circumstances or situations, nor constrained by any code or law, nor are you punishable for any offense, nor are you capable of any, for there is no such thing as being offensive in the eyes of God. It is only within the context of this promise that God's great plan can be completed. You have no obligation in relationship. You have only opportunity. Opportunity, not obligation, is the cornership of religion. The basis of all spirituality. So long as you see it the other way around, you have missed the point. Relationship. Your relationship to all things was created as your perfect tool in the work of the soul. That is why all human relationships are sacred. It is why every personal relationship is holy. Never do anything in relationships out of a sense of obligation. Do whatever you do out of a sense of the glorious opportunity your relationship affords you to decide and to be who you really are. So, while there is no requirement, this much should be said. Long-term relationships do hold remarkable opportunities for mutual growth, mutual expression, and mutual fulfillment. But first, make sure you get into a relationship for the right reasons. Most people are still entering relationships for the wrong reasons. To end loneliness, to fill a gap, bring themselves love, or someone to love. And those are some of the better reasons. Others do so to solve their ego, end their depressions, improve their sex life, recover from a previous relationship, or, believe it or not, to relieve boredom. None of these re reasons will work. And unless something dramatic changes along the way, neither will the relationship. For most people, love is a response to need fulfillment. Everyone has needs. You need this, another needs that. You both see in each other a chance for need fulfillment. So you agree, tacitly, to a trade. I'll trade you what I've got if you'll give me what you've got. It's a transaction. But you don't tell the truth about it. You don't say, I trade you very much. You say, I love you very much. And then the disappointment begins. So be sure you and your mate agree on purpose. If you both agree at a conscious level that the purpose of your relationship is to create an opportunity, not an obligation, and that opportunity is for growth, for self-expression, for lifting your lives to their highest potential, for healing every false thought or small idea you ever had about you, and for ultimate reunion with God through the communion of your two souls, these are the right reasons to begin a relationship. This relationship has gotten off on the right foot. 
And you will never deserve your relationship nor anyone by seeing more in another than they are showing you. For there is more there, much more. It is only their fear that stops them from showing you. If others notice that you see them as more, they will feel safe to show you what you obviously already see. So the grander our vision, the grander their willingness to accept and display the part of them we have shown them. Isn't that how all truly blessed relationships work? Isn't that part of the healing process? The process by which we give people permission to let go of every false thought they've ever had about themselves. And that is the work of God. The work of the soul is to wake yourself up. The work of God is to wake everybody else up. We do this by seeing others as who they are, by reminding them of who they are. This you can do in two ways. By reminding them of who they are, which is very difficult because they will not believe you. Or by remembering who you are, which is much easier because you do not need their belief, only your own. Demonstrating this constantly ultimately reminds others of who they are, for they will see themselves in you. And so I have chosen you to be my messenger. You and many others for now, during these times immediately ahead, the world will need many trumpets to sound the clarion call. The world will need many voices to speak the words of truth and healing for which millions long. The world will need many hearts joined together in the work of the soul and prepared to do the work of God. Are you ready then to decide and declare your own eternal truth and to announce and articulate the glory of mine? It takes great courage to announce oneself as a man of God. The world will much more readily accept you as virtually anything else. But a man of God, an actual messenger? Every one of my messengers have been defiled. Far from gaining glory, they have gained nothing but heartache. Are you willing? Does your heart ache to tell the truth about me? Are you willing to endure the ridicule of your fellow human beings? Are you prepared to give up glory on earth, the greater glory of the soul, fully realized? You may think this is easy, this be who you really are business, but it's the most challenging thing you'll ever do in your lifetime. In fact, you may never get there. Few people do. Not in one lifetime, not in many. But do not fret. Do you think this is your first attempt? Doesn't it seem like you've been here before? You have, many times, many times. I tell you this to inspire you, for it takes the worry out of it. It assures you that the intention is for you not to fail. You will get as many chances as you want and need. You can come back again and again. If you do get to the next step, if you evolve to the next level, it's because you want to, not because you have to. You don't have to do anything. If you enjoy life at this level, if you feel this is the ultimate for you, you can have this experience over and over and over again. In fact, you have had it over and over and over again for exactly that reason. You love the drama. You love the pain. You love the not knowing, the mystery, the suspense. You love it all. That's why you are here. So let us remember there is no such thing as right or wrong in these matters. But by your decisions, you paint a portrait of who you are. Indeed, by the decisions of your states and nations have already painted such pictures. By their decisions, your religions have created lasting, indelible impressions. By their decisions, your societies have produced their self-portraits too. Are you pleased with these pictures? Are these the impressions you wish to make? Do these portraits represent who you are? Be careful of these questions. They may require you to think. And thinking is hard. Making value judgments is difficult. It places you at pure creation. Because there are many times you will have to say, I don't know. I do not know. Yet still you'll have to decide. And so you'll have to choose. You'll have to make an arbitrary choice. Such a choice, a decision coming from no previous personal knowledge, is called pure creation. And the individual is aware, deeply aware, 
that in making of such decisions is the self created. Most of you are not interested in such important work. Most of you would rather leave that to others. And so most of you are not self created, but creatures of habit, creatures created by others. Then when others have told you how you should feel and it runs directly counter to how you do feel, you experience a deep inner conflict. Something deep inside you tells you that what others have told you is not who you are. Now, where do you go with that? What do you do? The first place you go is to your religionists. The people who put you there in the first place. You go to your priests and your rabbis and your ministers and your teachers. And they tell you to stop listening to yourself. The worst of them will try to scare you away from it. Scare you away from what you intuitively know. They'll tell you about the devil, about Satan, about demons and evil spirits and hell and damnation and every frightening thing they can think of to get you to see how what you were intuitively knowing and feeling was wrong. And how the only place you'll find any comfort is in their thought, their idea, their theology, their definition of right and wrong, and their concept of who you are. The seduction here is that all you have to do to get instant approval is to agree. Agree, and you have instant approval. Some will even sing and shout and dance and wave their arms in hallelujah. That's hard to resist. Such approval, such rejoicing that you have seen the light, that you have been saved. Approvals and demonstrations seldom accompany inner decisions. Celebrations rarely surround choices to follow personal truth. In fact, quite the contrary. Not only may others fail to celebrate, they may actually subject you to ridicule. What, you're thinking of yourself? You're deciding on your own? You're applying your own yardsticks, your own judgments, your own values? Who do you think you are anyways? And indeed, that is precisely the question you are answering. But the work must be done very much alone, very much without reward, without approval, perhaps even without any notice. And so we ask a very good question. Why go on? Why even start off on such a path? What is to be gained from embarking on such a journey? Where is the incentive? What is the reason? The reason is ridiculously simple. There is nothing else to do. This is the only game in town. There is nothing else to do. In fact, there is nothing else you can do. You are going to be doing what you are doing for the rest of your life, just as you have been doing it since your birth. The only question is whether you'll be doing it consciously or unconsciously. You see, you cannot disembark from the journey. You embarked before you were born. Your birth is simply a sign that the journey has begun. So the question is not, why start off on such a path? You have already started off. You did so with the first beat of your heart. The question is, do I wish to walk this path consciously or unconsciously, with awareness or lack of awareness, as the cause of my experience or at the effect of it? For most of your life, you've lived at the effect of your experiences. Now you're invited to be the cause of them. That is what is known as consciousness. That is what is known as conscious living. That is what is called walking in awareness. And many of you have walked quite some distance, as I've said. You have made no small progress. So you should not feel that after all these lives, you've only come to this. Some of you are highly evolved creatures with a very short sense of self. You know who you are and who you'd like to become. Furthermore, you even know the way to get from here to there. That's a great sign. That's a sure indication of the fact that you now have very few lives to live. And that is good for you. And that is so because you say it is so. Not long ago, all you wanted to do was stay here. Now all you want to do is leave. That's a very good sign. Not long ago, you killed things. Bugs, plants, trees, animals, people. Now you cannot kill a thing without knowing exactly what you're doing and why. 
That is a very good sign. Not long ago, you lived life as though it had no purpose. Now you know it has no purpose, save the one you give it. And that is a very good sign. Not long ago, you begged the universe to bring you truth. Now you tell the universe your truth, and that is a very good sign. Not long ago, you sought to be rich and famous. Now you seek to be simply and wonderfully yourself. And not so long ago you feared me, but now you love me, enough to call me your equal. All of these are very, very good signs. And yes, my darling friend, it does get easier. The more you remember, the more you are able to experience, the more you know, so to speak, the more you know, the more you remember. It is a circle. So yes, it gets easier, it gets better, it becomes even more joyful. But remember, none of it has been exactly a drudge. I mean, you loved all of it, every last minute. Oh, it's delicious, this thing called life. It's a scrumptious experience, no? How much more scrumptious could I have made it? Are you not being allowed to experience everything? The tears, the joy, the pain, the gladness? The win, the lose, the exaltation, the massive depression. What more is there? Less pain without more wisdom defeats your purpose. It does not allow you to experience infinite joy, which is what I am. Be patient. You are gaining wisdom. And your joys are now increasingly available without pain. That too is a very good sign. You are remembering how to love without pain to let go without pain, to create without pain, to even cry without pain. Yes, you're even able to have your pain without pain, if you know what I mean. And so then, keep on growing, my son. Keep on becoming, and keep on deciding what you want. And keep on deciding what you want to become in the next highest version of yourself. Keep on working toward that. Keep on. This is God work we're up to, you and I, so keep on.